Hello, everyone uh, from the United States. Tom Tradup, contributing editor of AllIsrael.com, along with our founder and CEO, Joel Rosenberg. Joel, welcome. Thank you. Great to be with you, Tom. And thank you for, you know, you you signed on to uh, uh, be a, a senior advisor for strategy and help us with news and content. Um, you, you've entered at such a time as this. It's the most dramatic moment, probably in the, you know, one of them in the modern history of Israel. And we need your help. You course, being a, a vice president at Salem, the biggest Christian radio uh, organization in the United States. Uh, thank you for coming on board and helping us at this critical time. It's an honor. And and why don't we start our first conversation by asking you to tell people we're uh, putting this together near the end of day four of this horrible uh, attack on Israel. Uh, Joel, tell us what the atmosphere is like there for people like you on the ground. What's happening now? Um, I know we had a story on All Israel Today that said at that point about 1,500 Hamas terrorists had been killed. Uh, we can't probably give updated figures because this will air later, but uh, what's it like to be on the ground there? Tell Americans what it's like. Well, as we end day four, Tom, uh, uh, the biggest uh, dynamic is that we're shifting from defense into offense. That's important for people to know because, you know, it was really shock on day one, right? We we woke up on a Jewish holiday. It also yes. happened to be the Sabbath, Shabbat, Saturday morning. Uh, the, the war began around 630 in the morning, local time. Um, um, but I didn't really hear about it until the sirens started going off here in Jerusalem a couple hours later. They'd been firing rockets at, uh, at southern Israeli communities, but they hadn't yet fired at Jerusalem. Uh, so I, you know, my wife and I and our family were still asleep. Um, at, 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 we're empty nesters now, but our oldest son and his wife and her brother had come to visit Israel for the, uh, well, Caleb came when we first moved here uh, nine years ago, lived here, worked here for several years in media, and then went back to marry uh, his college sweetheart. But so it, but then COVID happened and life happened and suddenly they finally came and then her brother wanted to come too to Israel for the first time and and then boom suddenly there's a, there's a war right so they had already been here for a week and then they could you know the, the airport didn't close but there were almost no flights out and so they literally just took off a few hours ago uh, having been canceled on four different rounds of flights. Um, I say this because they they texted us from the tarmac. Um, they're on this plane. They're they're ready to take off, and they're hearing boom, 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 as the Iron Dome anti rocket system is taking out rockets around the airport. Okay, imagine now. You know Caleb is experienced, uh, but but his wife and and uh, and her brother had never been here before we had a great time in egypt with them and then touring them all over the country they were it was just at the end for them but suddenly they're hearing sirens we're running to our bomb shelter um it was a whole new world for them and uh and for all israelis it was the shock in those early hours of how how did israeli intelligence so completely miss this why was that border with Gaza and Israel so so lightly defended? It almost wasn't defended at all. There was almost no combat soldiers on yes. duty, uh, and 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 so and now with the more that we learn, um, we are seeing the the casualty numbers: nine hundred Israelis uh, murdered in four days. Like that is just off the charts. We've never Israel's never lost nine hundred civilians. I'm not sure ever, but certainly not in a four-day period. Um, it's usually military uh, casualties because they're you're fighting a war. But this is terrorism, and uh, and 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 Hamas is acting like ISIS. They're chopping off the heads of babies. They're they're murdering women and children in front of each other. It's inconceivable. They're, they're setting they were setting houses on fire with Jews trapped in them to burn them alive. And this is like ISIS. And, uh, and of course, taking hostages. So the country's grieving. Uh, the country's in shock. The country's in anger, in angry. But I'll just wrap that part up to say we're shifting now. Um, we can't come out of grief. That'll take a long, long time. But we are unified. Hamas has done something that nobody else in Israel could do. Unify the country, which was deeply divided this year, 
for lots of reasons, but we are now about to go, we are now going on offense in an air war first, but we're getting ready for a massive ground invasion. And obviously we'll talk about that, but that's going to be messy and it's going to be long, but we have to win this. You have stated on American media, I've heard a number of interviews that you've done, that one of the things that's very disturbing, in addition to this happening almost 50 years to the day of the Yom Kippur War, happening uh, during Simcha Torah, during Sabbath, uh, Sabbath um, apart from the just sheer horror of this coordinated air, land, and sea attack, the idea that now there are people within the government here in the United States, the Biden administration, who are counseling Israel to sort of work toward a ceasefire and try to back off any kind of violent retribution for it. And and you made a, an analogy that I'd like you to share with people watching about what we would have done in the United States if there had been a gunman killing mm -hmm. school children. What would we have done? Tell that story. Yeah. So, Tom, you live in Dallas. Imagine um, that that an elementary school was taken over by, you know, one or two or three, you know, crazed gunmen with an AK-47 or an AR-15 or whatever. And we're just killing children nonstop. And the all the police and the SWAT teams arrive and surround the elementary school. And then the mayor suddenly goes on television and says, hey, hey, hey let's de-escalate. Look, look, look I, I, I don't want the police to use so much force. I, let's, let's have a ceasefire. Well, look, if you can get the, 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 uh, the gunmen or the gun, you know, the, the, the mass shooters to come out peacefully, okay. But if they're in the middle of killing people, nobody thinks that it's a good idea to de-escalate. You want to arrest, capture, or kill that shooter or those multiple shooters as rapidly as possible to save the children. And so you're already seeing in the media and in various and from the UN and from and we're going to hear it more and more, you know, uh, hey, hey, Israel, you know, you're using disproportionate amount of force. Well, that's what the police are supposed to do. It's, you know, you know, it may be one shooter, but you send like 500 cops to go, you know, surround them and, 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 and you want a sniper to take them out, a sharpshooter. So, but so as we go on offense, Tom, I, I need all Israel news readers and viewers to understand and brace themselves that the world and especially the world media is going to turn against Israel. And this is what Hamas wants. And Hamas isn't even calling the shots anyway. This is all coming from the Iranian regime. The Iranian regime wants to blow up the, the Arab-Israeli peace process where more and more Arab countries are making peace with Israel. And now the Saudis want to make peace with Israel. The Iranian regime can't abide by that. They're horrified by that. And so they want to make Israel look like monsters. And the way to do that is lure us into a ground war in Gaza, in which the goal for Iranian leaders isn't just to kill Jews. Of course, they want to kill as many Jews as possible using their proxy terror forces like Hamas. But what they what the Iranian supreme leader really wants is to kill Palestinians. Why? Because the more Palestinians that die, even if they're actual militants, uh, terrorists, let's say, uh, because that's who they are, the more that they die, the more body count there is, the more the media will say, hey, hey, this is Israel's fault. And, and, and Hamas is hiding behind Israeli hostages that they've taken and behind two million Palestinian civilians who aren't responsible for this. This is the Hamas terror it was their responsibility, but they're hiding in in kindergartens and and other schools and yes. hospitals and playgrounds and and so when Israel tries to be careful not to kill innocent civilians, it's very difficult to do because the terrorists are embedded in the civilian population, which by the way is itself a war crime. And then every time they fire a missile at our innocent civilians, that's a war crime. So every missile that's fired is a double war crime. So that's what's going on right now. And I think you just, our audience has to brace itself for the ferocity of anti-Israel media and demonstrations and political statements that are gonna come like Niagara Falls. Joel, you raised the issue of Hamas using children particularly, which is 
heinous, but but men, women, and children as human shields, essentially. It's the old um, Saddam Hussein trick, don't attack me because you'd be killing civilians. And Israel has always been so good at announcing, some people don't understand why, they go, why don't they just go in and hit them? They, because of the humanitarian uh, decency of Israel, they announce we're going into Gaza, we're going into wherever this particular area is, there's a pocket of terrorists and militants. It's up then to people to get out, but in fact, aren't they barricading their own people in so that the civilians can't get out? So they're going to be victims, as you said. Yes, a hundred percent, and it's already starting to happen. And um, so, historically, uh, I mean, maybe let's say the last ten years, Prime Minister Netanyahu has not wanted to invade Gaza. The last time uh, he sent ground forces into Gaza, I believe, was twenty fourteen. Something was known as Operation Protective Edge. But at the time, it was because of the rocket fire. But as we developed and 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 improved the Iron Dome anti-rocket system, we really didn't have to invade because it was terrible that these rockets kept coming and coming. But the, the Iron Dome knocked down about 95% of them. So why send Israeli young men and women into fight house to house, street to street, apartment to apartment, you know, with booby traps and landmines and all the messiness and horror of it? Why do that when all you're really trying to do is knock down um, these these uh, these rockets and then go do precise airstrikes to take out the rocket launchers and the command centers? But now the the death toll is just too high, never before seen, never before experienced in the history of Israel. Again, more Jews killed in the last four days than any time since the Holocaust. So we're going to have to go in and it's going to be messy and there are unfortunately going to be civilian casualties and that's the the plan of the supreme leader of Iran and his his inner circle to 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 flip the the, the script to change the brand of Israel which is that we are now peacemakers in the region and more and more people want to trade with us and and buy our technology and invest in our companies and have you know tourism that's been the Abraham Accords narrative and it's been wonderful of course we've right. covered it here at all Israel news and all Arab news very very well but but now they want to turn us into some monsters and so uh but we have to go in and we have to win and um and again Iran and Hamas have unified Israel in a way that we have not been this unified, I don't think, ever since I've lived here and I've been here nine years, ever since I moved here 30 or start, started visiting here 35 years ago, 36 years ago. So the the, the all the uh, judicial reform uh, uh, protests, those are over. All mm -hmm. the soldiers that said they wouldn't serve under Netanyahu, they've all you know, come back to their units because we are focused. We are unified. We don't want to have to go to this war, but we're going to do it and we're going to win. And when we win, we will have liberated Gaza. And then the question is, could there be a moderate, reasonable government that emerges? And when the Palestinian terror movement has been completely destroyed, is it possible that the Palestinians will say, all right, we in the West Bank and Gaza saying, look, we don't love Israel, but they're here to stay, and we'd rather have peace with Israel than to keep fighting because it just ruins our lives. That could be promising, but between here and there, it's going to be bloody and bad and lonely. Let me ask this question. Um, we don't want to get too many X's and O's that uh, listeners would not understand, but as far as the Iron Dome goes, and I was fortunate enough to have IDF uh, forces fly me over uh, in the years when they were building the Iron Dome. So I know how it works. I've seen it. It's magnificent. As you said, Joel, it's about 98, 99% effective in knocking down missiles. But the part that I think a lot of people don't understand about it, and you know very well, is that People in the Gaza Strip or in the West Bank, whatever, can take a rocket tube and shove a bunch of nails and shrapnel and broken glass into it and fire it into Israel. That probably costs them maybe $1,500. When they fire a Patriot missile or a missile to 
shoot it down, it can cost upwards of $50,000. When we see thousands and thousands of missiles coming in at the same time as we saw on Saturday, it didn't overwhelm the Iron Dome, but there were it just simply couldn't handle that many. My question is, does Israel have enough capability and, and the money to keep operating the Iron Dome? I know there's no option but to do it, but is that a factor? Uh, well, it's classified, uh, so I can't, I don't know uh, how much we have. I do know that our deal with the United States government is that Israel invented the Iron Dome, but the United States taxpayer paid for it um, and now benefits from it because it, the United States military uses it, uh, versions of it for its own protection uh, around the world. So, but but the deal is that all the interceptors are built by American companies and so it was last year uh, that President Biden and then Congress passed a one billion dollar replenishment, um, and and uh, but you're right, you can go through them very very quickly. Um, you, when I moved here nine years ago with my family to become a dual U.S. Israeli citizen, Tom, uh, we came in the middle of a, a terrible rocket war, and at that time, Hamas fired about four thousand rockets at Israel in a one month period. We're almost at 4,000 rockets in a four day period, okay? And that's part of the staggering intelligence failure of Israel. How, we didn't know that they had that many, but it means that our systems are getting overwhelmed. And um, and 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 so, there, so a lot more rockets are getting through, a lot more people, Israelis are being killed by the rockets, a lot of more homes and cars are being damaged. Uh, my son, uh, one of my sons, was driving from the uh, from the uh, Mediterranean coast near Tel Aviv today back towards Jerusalem, and he and his colleague they were doing humanitarian relief work for our ministry, the Joshua Fund. They had a they heard the sirens four different times, had to pull over, dive for cover four times on the way just driving from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. So, thank God they weren't injured, uh, but but this is what's happening. So no, we don't have enough for the long haul. We need uh, bipartisan support. Um, and uh, unfortunately, there's not a Speaker of the House right now. So that's a problem. So you got you got a cascade of issues right now. Um, I will say, I, I, I do need to say this about President Biden. President Biden is the most pro-Israel figure, I think, in the Democratic Party. So he has been very supportive of the Iron Dome and other things like that. So that's good, okay? At the same time, Biden just gave $6 billion to the terrorist regime in Iran a couple of weeks ago, okay? So on the one hand, he he loves Israel and he says, I stand with Israel, which is true. On the other hand, he's giving billions of dollars to the, our worst enemy, which emboldens them. The Iranian regime in, in Tehran don't think, oh, that's so nice. President Biden is so kind. No, they think, what a sucker. And if he's going to give us $6 billion, then that's $6 billion worth of more terror that we can we can do. And so let's so this is a problem. Uh, President Biden's foreign policy has been so bad, so weak that it led to the collapse of the democratically elected uh, government in Afghanistan. And the Taliban took over on the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Uh, Biden has been so weak on foreign policy that Vladimir Putin, who didn't invade a single country during the Trump years, yes. immediately invaded Ukraine, right? And now the Chinese are thinking, well, maybe if we want to get Taiwan, you know, maybe we ought to go now. Hamas thought, well, you know, that's, Biden, that's let's, let's go and hit Israel now. So this is a larger failure of the Biden policies, but but what you're going to hear at all Israel news and you're not going to hear it everywhere else is we can, we we need to be honest and criticize Biden where we have to, but we have to also remember we need Israel Israel needs and people who love Israel need Christians who love Israel need we need a bipartisan approach to Israel. We need these votes to pass. We need arms to come here. Um, because Israel's too small to defend ourselves. We, we defend ourselves by ourselves, but we need weapon systems to help us. And America has always stood with us from both parties. And if that breaks down, that's a very, very serious problem. Of course. I, I'd like to bring this down maybe to the street level. Um, 
all Israel news has been so fantastic. The coverage is unparalleled in terms of websites. I go to them all over the world. And uh, it your staff is spectacularly good at updating things, at, at bringing stories that Americans may not see, may not want to see. But when they go on the website, all of a sudden, this war becomes 3D and they understand what Israelis are going through. And in that vein, I saw a video somewhere in the last few days of a funeral that was taking place. Um, Israelis uh, were at a funeral and nearby a, a rocket must have landed or perhaps it was a, a bomb that went off. You heard an explosion. Everyone kind of ducked a little bit and then got back up and just continued with the with the observance. And in this country, people would have fled and run for cover and driven away and that just is that just part of life that people have to understand if they're living in Israel that comes with the territory and they just are going to live as normal lives as possible, even during this horrible war? Well, unfortunately, yes. I, I, I don't want to say we've become blasé or or we're used to it, but but we're experienced. And uh, you're right. Uh, when you're fir- when I first experienced a rocket attack. Uh, maybe 15 years ago when I was, I didn't live here. I was coming to work with the Joshua Fund ministry that my wife and I founded. Uh, The Joshua Fund is a ministry that has raised and invested about $100 million in humanitarian relief and in strengthening the local church here in Israel and among the Palestinians and our neighboring Arab countries. Um, And we, you know, we bought neonatal intensive care equipment for Israeli hospitals and so forth. So, uh, but yeah, when I first experienced it, it sheer terror. But over time, partly it's a I'm growing in my faith, but also I've I've experienced a lot of rocket attacks in my life. Now I've seen the Iron Dome criss zip you know crisscrossing through the sky over my head, saving my life and the lives of my family and my friends. Um, so I'm not saying there isn't a burst of adrenaline when I hear the sirens go off again, but but I know that God is with me and I know that I've been through it before. And uh, I also, I happen to know that if I die, I'm, I'll be in heaven an instant later. So, but even Israelis who don't know exactly where they're going when they die, uh, which is a separate issue and an important issue, but, but they become, they're, they're, um, they're, they're they have a resolve. They have a grit. They're Jews, right? We are Jews and we've been through this for 4,000 years. People hate us. Um, I mean, we actually have, there's a, there's a prayer that, that people say on Passover, right? Passover can be a long four, five, six hour, um, uh, you know, event for the most religious Jews, but secular Jews, they still celebrate, but they say, uh, they tried to kill us. Um, they didn't, let's eat. <laughs> if, if you're a Go little bit, <laughs> if you're a little bit religious, you'll say they tried to kill us. God saved us. Let's see. That's the short version of that prayer. It sounds funny, and it is funny, but it comes from years of experience and and a resolve. It's bad, but I'm not going to let them stop me. We're going to keep moving forward. And that is something I love about the Israeli character. Um, in its weaker moments, it's, it, it, you know, what what is stubborn and, you know, hard-headed – in its negative is tenacious and resilient in its positive. And so right now we're seeing the positive uh, character, but I will say one other thing before we wrap Tom. And um, I mentioned earlier that Hamas has done in four days, what nobody in the Israeli political sphere has been able to do all year. And that is unified the country. And um, now, you know, Hamas doesn't get any credit for that, but I just mean it was a, it was a sign of how, secure Israelis have felt that we went at each other with such venom um, on various political issues. I'm not saying they weren't important issues. They're very important issues here and all Israel news and the Rosenberg report. We've been covering these things uh, in a lot of depth and, and nuance, but I'm just saying that when we have an external threat, we don't get into these internal fights. And right now yes. everybody has set aside the internal fights, which are real, and we're focused on our external enemy, and we're very unified. Last night, Prime Minister Netanyahu addressed the nation here in Israel on a live television broadcast, and he called for an emergency unity government. 
that has happened in the past, and 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 he's asking for it to happen now. What would that look like? It would mean the leaders of the opposition parties would set aside their disagreements on this, that, or the other thing, and say, for the sake of strategizing and then executing and winning and completing this war, we don't want to look divided. We don't want we don't want to be divided. We need to work together. And I absolutely think that's what's needed. And I hope that's what actually happens. And for all I know, by the time this airs on day five, we, we may be closer. Or we may actually have a deal. I'll give you one example. Benny Gantz is right now the yes. most popular politician in Israel. He's the former chief of staff of the Israeli military, served 36 years in the Israeli military, became later the defense minister in um, in, in, in a, a recent government, um, actually made a deal with Netanyahu several years ago to create an, a rotating premier, uh, premiership, but then Bibi you know, welched on the deal. And anyway, that was the whole issue. But my point is Benny Gantz right now is taking the lead in the negotiations to join this government. His wealth of military experience would be enormously valuable uh, to Netanyahu and his team. And um, in Gantz's party, uh, I think the number three person is a guy named Gadi Eisenkot. I know these both these men both. I know Netanyahu, I know Gantz, and I know Gadi Eisenkot. Gadi Eisenkot is another former chief of staff of the Israeli military. And so I'm saying that it would be very, very helpful right now because this is going to be a very difficult war and it could open up another front in Lebanon. It could open up. Look, if, if, if a war opens up with Lebanon, I think Israel is going to hit Tehran hard. Um, I think mm -hmm. they're going to bring the fight to where it's coming from. Right now, I don't think they're going to do that. But if we go to another level. So what I'm saying is one of the things we're going to be watching at All Israel News and on my TV show is can the country unify and, and get an emergency government that is unified. This may involve, Tom, the either the removal of the most controversial man in the government, uh, uh, Itamar ben Gavir, either from the government as a whole or at least from the security cabinet and the upper echelons. Um, I don't know that yet, but but I, I think the next few days are going to be very interesting. And as painful as this is, I think there's going to, it's going to be hopeful internally, but then the world is going to turn against and the media is going to turn against Israel. And that's why all Israel news exists, because we know that. And we we tried to get a head start on it. And I'm grateful. Well, that I have a final question uh, for yeah, you. Please. Your perspective is so amazing uh, and on target. Uh, and I know people turn to all Israel news for the latest breaking news, but also for the perspective that you always add uh, not only on the website, but also on the Rosenberg Report. So I'm, I'm asking you this question, as evangelicals turn to all Israel news in greater numbers, people of faith around the world, and especially evangelical Christians, are right now on their knees praying for Israel. Joel, what would you ask Christians specifically to pray for at this time for Israel? Well, that's a great question, Tom, and I'm, I'm so glad you asked it. And, I'm, and it's one of the reasons we appreciate that we have senior leadership on our team that are evangelical Christians or Messianic Jews to bring a biblical worldview, that we're not just doing news. We're trying to understand the world uh, from a biblical perspective. I would say a couple of things. Obviously, we're praying for the peace of Jerusalem. So that, that that goes without saying. But what I would also say is, is a few other examples. Remember, uh, in, in the Old Testament, um, uh, David and his uh, his band of mighty men, they're off fighting the Philistines at one point, and then there comes a raid against their town, and a bunch of and their wives and children are captured and taken away. Uh, we need Netanyahu and his leadership to have the spirit of those mighty men and and you know and David's wisdom to go get the, our hostages back. I don't know if it's possible. It will take the a miracle of God because they all could die in, in the coming hours. But that's what I'm praying for. Just as David was successful by the grace and mercy and power of God, the God of Israel, to get those people back, that's what I'm praying for. That's why I ask people to pray for. Second, um, we need our Israeli leaders to be like the sons of Issachar, 
where the scripture said they understood the times and they knew what Israel should do, right? This, this is a time where we need supernatural wisdom. Now, none of the leaders at the top echelons of Israel are followers of Jesus. They don't have the Holy Spirit because they're not followers of Jesus. They're, they're good men and women. They have a lot of experience, but we need to intercede for them, okay? That's what evangelicals need to do. Um, yes, they all need to know Jesus personally, but right now we need them to have the wisdom of God, and that's what our job is to intercede for them. We also need to pray, of course, to intercede that God would give peace that passes all comprehension to those who are traumatized by all the bloodshed and, and, and people who've lost their loved ones, people who have seen their loved ones killed in front of their eyes, people who've been wounded, people whose loved ones have been captured and taken into you know ISIS domain, right, into the Gaza Strip. All of that is, is, is what we need, but we need a couple other things real quickly. One, we need to pray for the Palestinians who are under this reign of terror and facing the biggest, mightiest army in the in the region coming for them, not for them, but for the terrorists that are holding them hostage. Right. I don't I don't want our readers and listeners to to do what I'm seeing on social media and I'm starting to punch back at it. Like, just why don't we just, you know, wipe out all of Gaza, just 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 level everybody. Well, that was an Old Testament way. That's not the New Testament way. That's not the Christian way. We need to go bring justice to the terrorists, but we want to pray for compassion for those who are innocent. But we also have to pray for our enemies. I pray that every single one of those Hamas terrorists converts or dies. Right? I want them to get saved and, and, and abandon the field of battle. But if they don't do that, then I want them to die. But like, like that's my prayer. And I encourage other people to pray that. And obviously we need to pray that the United States helps and doesn't harm the situation. And and um, and I would finally ask people to not just pray, but to financially give to all Israel News. We're still a fairly young and uh, not robustly funded organization, but we're providing, I think, some of the best coverage that is out there. And uh, there, well, it's it, there literally isn't another daily digital news platform that's run by Israeli believers for the world's even juggles. It just doesn't exist. That's why we started All Israel News and why we've needed people like you, Tom, to come and provide more experience and help us at this critical time. And But that that costs money. And so, you know, I, I just ask people, if you want to help in a very practical way, we could use donations right now to All Israel News so we can do the job that God has called us to do and keep you informed every moment of the day. And the easiest way to do that, of course, is there is a, a, a button on the website. It makes it very easy for people to do an online gift. We pray that they will do that. And and I want to thank you, Joel Rosenberg, for not only the leadership and vision that you had to start All Israel News and All Arab News to, to bridge these uh, warring factions at one time and to seek common ground, but for what you're doing this week, especially it's so critically important, and we appreciate the time you spent with us today. Well, Tom, I'm grateful to you. You've got a lot of things on your plate as well, but you decided that, the, and and you didn't know this war was coming. None of us did, but just as I, you signed up and suited up, uh, we 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 suddenly know why you're here. And I'm grateful, and I look forward to doing more. It may be daily, it may be every other day, but let's uh, let's keep people informed um, through these uh, unique uh, and exclusive. Um, uh, broadcast that we do. Thank you so much. And yes, to sir. all of our viewers, God bless you.